Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Kenneth Scholler. I'm a philosophy professor at the County College of Morris. I earned my doctoral degree at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And today I wanted to talk to you about how philosophy can apply to everyday occurrences. I always get some portion of ethics into my courses. The uh, two summer courses that I'll be teaching, summer session two, are Intro to Philosophy and Ethics. And there's always a portion of ethics in there. And I wanted to show today, by use of a famous ethical principle known as utilitarianism, how this applies to, can apply to everyday life. First off, let's take a kind of ordinary occurrence uh, that might crop up. You're out to lunch and you've had two glasses of wine, let's say, and uh, you enjoy those glasses and you think a third would even enhance your pleasure so it might bump up your pleasure quotient from six units of pleasure to eight units of pleasure. Uh, but then you also think, well, that could make me late getting back to the office, uh, my concentration might suffer, I might be reprimanded, and so you start to think of the units of pain that follow on that, those initial pleasures. It could be that the ten units of pain uh, that await you would, would outstrip the initial pleasure, and so in that regard it has a negative pleasure calculus. This idea goes back to Jeremy Bentham, a British philosopher, who wrote the Principles of Morals and Legislation in 1780 at the age of 32. He wrote this enormous tome, uh, for some 400 pages, and he had in there all the components of this happiness calculus. He called it the philosophic calculus, but the happiness calculus will do. Among those components that he had in there was he had a whole science of pleasures and pains. So he had seven pleasure factors. One was the intensity of a pleasure, or how, how strong it is. Second, the duration of a pleasure, how long it lasts. The third is the extent of a pleasure, how many people are affected by it. So he, he used all of these to calculate whether decisions were good decisions or bad, or actions good decisions or bad. So let's apply that to something now that's you know, very much going on in the culture. With the pandemic, people want live sports to be back. I hear this clamoring all the time, it's on programs, and in particular baseball, since this would be baseball season, if not for the pandemic, they want baseball back. Um, and they seem to believe that this would be good, this would promote people's happiness, uh, and in fact there's a vacuum in our lives that can be filled in no other way but by baseball. I happen to think that both of those statements are false, and I'm going to use utilitarianism and Bentham's felicity calculus to show that they're false. The first statement says that this would bump up my pleasure calculus to see live baseball events. For me in particular, it would not. Baseball has a record of cheating now that goes back to about 1985 and the dawn of anabolic steroids. Uh, Jose Canseco proudly declares himself the godfather of steroids and he was the first to use them. And uh, since then you've had human growth hormone, androstene dion, other chemicals, and recently, if you've been paying attention, the electronic cheating, so the stealing of signs by ov looking over the pitcher's shoulder, what the catcher is flashing as a sign, whether it's a curveball or a fastball or a uh, split finger pitch that's coming, and these signs are relayed to people in the dugout who then by some system of uh, communication banging on drums, as the case with the Astros, relay them to the batter who then knows what pitch is coming, a fastball or a curveball. If a major league hitter knows that a fastball is coming, a major league hitter will hit a fastball. They've been, that's part of their training is they'll hit a ball 95 miles an hour that's coming straight. Uh, we can't do that, they can. So, but, so knowing that this is the background of baseball since the 1980s, this causes me to have less than a uh, perfect aesthetic pleasure while watching the games. I'm always skeptical of the player coming up to bat. Is he just a bit too thick? thick through the chest, broad through the shoulders, thicker than the people I grew up with. Mantle, Mays, and Aaron, that would be Mickey Mantle, or Willie Mays, and Hank Aaron, the best three players of that time, who didn't cheat. Uh, and we know they didn't cheat, their body shapes didn't change over time, their productivity was pretty much even, consistent throughout their careers, which lasted each about 20 years. Uh, and so, knowing that they, what I might be watching is, is not on the up and up, uh, it compromises my aesthetic pleasure. In fact, competition is a terrific thing. Whether this boxer is better than that boxer, whether this team is better than that team, is inherently interesting. What It ceases to be interesting to me, though, when I think it's always in the back of my mind that the ball that I just saw hit 450 feet, did that occur as a result of natural ability, 
or did that occur as a result of chemical enhancement? After all, what we're trying to find out is if, th is if this player is better than that player, not whether this player's uh, cells can process performance-enhancing chemicals better than this other player's cells. That's of no interest to me. So, baseball to me and uh, other sports don't have cheating to this extent, although I would say track and field, uh, Ben Johnson running the 978 in the uh, Seoul Olympics uh, in 1988, or uh, if I like cycling, cycling, uh, Lance Armstrong's seven uh, victories in the Tour de France were also gotten by ill means. Both of those people used steroids. Uh, so then I, I, that would ruin my uh, aesthetic pleasure there too. Uh, the second part of this argument that it will enhance our pleasure is that we can't get this uh, viewing pleasure or uh, bump in uh, the felicity calculus in any other way. Um, well, for me, it's easy to get it some other way because there's three possibilities, right? Something can be a negative viewing pleasure, or it can be right at zero, not good and not bad, or it can be positive. For me, it's either oftentimes slightly positive from watching a team that I like and I presume that they're not cheating, or it's even, or it's, it's uh, negative if I, have, if I have a strong suspicion that they are cheating. But I can get that pleasure in another way. Uh, I get it now. I write, I read, I walk the dogs. I play basketball at this old dilapidated hoop past the tennis courts near my home. Um, I'm even watching all ten parts of Michael Jordan's Last Dance documentary. So those all enhance my viewing pleasure. They're kind of pure aesthetic pleasures because this nagging doubt, uh, this residue of doubt that comes with watching the uh, baseball games, isn't there. And uh, again, this is not something I made up, it's something I've been trained to be skeptical about over time, now entering its fifth decade starting being started in the 1980s. So this is an example of how a philosophy like Jeremy Bentham's uh, Felicity Calculus that affects our lives in most every way can be applied to everyday events. And uh, I thought I would talk to you about that today. It can really turn our ordinary thinking around and make us think differently about things and go beneath the assumptions that we're making to come up with a different argument. So I've enjoyed talking to you about this today. Maybe I'll see you down the road uh, in one of my philosophy classes. Thank you. I'm Kenneth Scholler. Hope to see you soon. Bye.